The story begins with uh, one brother missing and the other brother laying on the floor in the form of a human ex. The father is outside smoking a cigarette and that father is me but you know, I've changed so much as a man that I really bear no resemblance to the man that I once was. Uh, for the purposes of this story, I'm going to try to tell it from my son's point of view. And uh, I'll refer to my ex-wife, Penny, as the mother, and I'll refer to the missing brother as the baby. As far as the brother laying in the ex, well, nowadays I'm very careful to call him Matthew, but, you know, back then we called him Matty. And so I'm going to call him Matty. And I'm going to try to tell the story from his point of view, which, as everyone from my ex-wife to my court-ordered psychiatrist can tell you, is a point of view that I rarely considered when this story began. Joseph Juppé said, fear and love. Everything a father of a family does must go to inspire one or the other. And the following author Brock Clark argues just how difficult it can be as a father when all you're trying to do is inspire love, but all you have is fear to give. A son's point of view by Brock Clark. So the baby is missing, and the parents had asked Maddie to keep an eye on his younger brother, which they naturally assume means that he won't let him drink any toxic cleaning solutions or stick his head in the gas oven. And so the mother comes in, and she says, where's your brother? And Maddie considers the question for a minute. You know, he doesn't want to offer up any sort of excuses like, uh, oh, the baby uh, uh, crawled on down to the mall and signed up for a four-year stretch in the army. Or, or the baby's out finishing his paper route. He'll be done in 15 minutes. Or, or the baby's out crawling a marathon. How long does a marathon take? I said I was going to try to tell the story from Maddie's point of view. So <clears throat> the mother, she has the back of her hand up against her forehead. It's this melodramatic gesture that she's undoubtedly learned from the television, which is on so damn much that you can't blame Maddie for being as flaky as he is. So she says, um, do you have any idea where your brother might be? And Maddie, he says, uh, it's a parent's worst nightmare, which is something that he's heard from television, which goes to show that the television is in fact on too damn much and that the mother is going to rot Maddie's brain if she isn't careful. The mother storms out of the house, and the father stomps double time over towards Maddie, and he clenches up his fist and begins to hit his fist against the side of his legs and makes this dull thwacking sound. And Maddie hears this sound and begins to think of himself less as a seven year old boy and more as something that makes a thwacking sound when hit by a fist. Look, I. I know I said I was going to try to tell the story from Maddie's point of view, and from Maddie's point of view, it certainly seems like the father is about to strike his son, but I should point out that while there will be some horrible violence in this story in the form of a serrated kitchen knife, the father is not about to strike his son, nor has he ever hit his son, nor will he ever. And I feel like I should put the father in some sort of context so it would be a little easier to understand him, you know? Because Maddie can't know what it's like for a father to live in a small town and expect to work in the paper mills for the rest of his life, except for when he turns 18, the mills go belly up. So the father doesn't have a job, and neither does his father. Maddie can't know what it's like to feel the cold for nine months out of the year because you have to cut your house up into apartments and you can't afford to heat the whole place. And Maddie can't know what it's like to feel this much violence and this much frustration and this much anger and just know that if you could get someplace warm, then all the violence and everything else would just melt away because you could find the right girl and you could find the right job and everything else would just fit in. But all of a sudden, the father feels like a failure twice as much now because he's been a failure in two places instead of just one. You know, but hey, we're telling the story from Maddie's point of view and obviously Maddie isn't interested in hearing the whole damn story anyway. A son should never be smarter than his father, which is where Maddie went so wrong, and which is why I was never very proud to have him as a son. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, when Maddie was six, uh, we went to his very first baseball game. 
and, and he swung at the first pitch. He completely missed it. So I yelled to him from the stands. I said, Matt, you got to keep your damn eyes open to keep, hit the damn ball. And he didn't keep his eyes open, and he didn't hit the ball. I didn't even think he heard what I'd said until in the car on the way home, he tapped me on the shoulder. And he said, you said at the game that I got to keep my eyes open. You should have said, I have to keep my eyes open. I learned that one back in kindergarten. I mean, do you see what I mean about a son being smarter than you are? I mean, how can you relate to a kid who talks to you like that? As a point of comparison, six years later, I yelled the same exact thing to Steve, the baby, and he didn't correct my grammar. And he hit the ball. So, and now you know that the baby was not missing, not really. We found him hiding underneath the stairs that lead up to the house. Look, I, I know I said I was going to try to tell the story from Maddie's point of view, but at a certain point you have to say enough is enough. So Maddie's viewpoint is out. And the mother can hardly be called reliable or objective, so her viewpoint is out too. And the baby is too young, so that leaves us with the father. The father's view viewpoint is, what a day. You well, know, I need a beer. So he grabs the car keys, he goes out to his car, and there's Maddie sitting in the passenger seat. So he says, okay, you can take a ride with me. But he's also thinking, fuck you, you little shit. You know, like most fathers would. The drive to the store is spent in silence, which you would think would ease the father's mood some, but it doesn't, because the father feels like Maddie is judging him somehow. So he goes to the store, he buys his case of beer, drinks one beer before he even gets back into the car, and in driving home, and in thinking about reaching into the back seat to grab another beer, the father misses the turn to his own house. And of course, Maddie notices, and he can't just shut up about it. He's got to say, Dad, where are we going? As if the father intentionally chose a different, longer way to get home. So, you know, this pretty much tears. And the father says, Maddie, I'm not your real father. Oh. He's kidding. Uh -huh. Of course he's kidding. Even though Maddie is so strange and weird, the father sometimes fantasizes that Maddie is not his own son. He, he's trying to rattle the father. But Maddie isn't rattled. Or doesn't appear to be. So the father feels like he has no choice but to continue his joke. Yeah, your real father told me to let you off here. He said he'd be by a little bit later to pick you up. Now, does he get the joke and laugh? Or does he break down crying like most normal kids would? No, he gets out of the car! So if the father feels like to say, hey, I'm only kidding now, would mean he was backing down to his son. And as any good father can tell you, you must never back down to your children. The father says, okay then, good luck. And he drives home. Does he feel bad about what he's done? Yeah, of course. But he also feels like he's taught his son some sort of valuable lesson, and that his son is smart enough to figure out to walk home once he's figured the lesson out. So, when the son does show up, the father is genuinely happy to see him. And maybe if he hadn't drunk six beers, he would have noticed that Maddie looked a little crazy around the eyes. So he follows Maddie into the kitchen, where he sees him holding a serrated carving knife up against his own throat. Now, now, this wouldn't normally be a big deal, because Maddie's always running around the house playing games where he's holding himself hostage with an imaginary knife, saying, don't make a move, and the father feels like this is a natural progression of that game. But it isn't a game. The father is as surprised as anyone else. And he sees Maddie drag that blade across his throat. And his hands start to shake a little. He hands the knife to his father, and he says, Dad, you hurt my son. What are we going to do? What is 
the sum of thinking. And does he want to die? Or is he trying to teach the father a lesson so that if he does die, then the whole family will be better off because of it? And the mother and the baby, I mean, what are they thinking? I mean, they're staring at the father as if the father just slit Maddie's throat, not Maddie himself. And what is the father thinking? The father is thinking how strange and how weird kids are. And that you have to be diligent in protecting them, especially from themselves. And he makes a private pledge. And he will always look out for his son's safety, no matter what. And he will try to look at things as they might. From a son's point of view. 